Hey everyone, Weston Nakamura here with Blockworks Macro. Welcome to a special edition of Market Depth. I am standing in front of the Bank of Japan, where Governor Haruhiko Kuroda will soon be ending his decade-long, unprecedented tenure as the governor of the Central Bank of Japan. This is a video that will cover his historic and history-shaping tenure. So let's dive in. Last uh, 15 years, prices have been declining and declining. Japan is the only exception to in the world which has experienced inflation. This is a monetary phenomenon. And the central bank, uh, meaning Bank of Japan, must do whatever thing necessary to eradicate inflation. It's not often that the Fed plays second fiddle to anyone, but the Bank of Japan is front and center today. And Bank of Japan decides to enter the money printing business. I thought central banks were meant to think long term. Is this Kuroda effectively being freaked out by three weeks of turbulence on, on capital markets? So crossing the delivery terminal here, the DOJ is saying that they're going to look at their yield curve at every single meeting there. No, look, I mean, the Bank of Japan succeeds by failing. So this over my shoulder is the Imperial Palace grounds, famously during the height of the Japan asset bubble. This plot of land was worth more than the entire land value of the state of California. So very lovely, yes. Was that a bubble? Probably. Concern about the purchasing of government bonds. So, oh, if I ask your opinion for who you think the most consequential central banker in the post 2008 financial crisis era is, um, and there's no right or wrong answer here, it's your own opinion, whoever you think it is, and however you want to define consequential. But I suspect that most of you would probably say one of the Fed chairs, right? And understandably so, the Fed is, after all, in my view, the Fed's the most powerful institution in the world. Uh, across all institutions, like more than the U.S. presidency, more than the U.S. Congress, the, the Supreme Court, the Pentagon, uh, more than like major multinational institutions like the U.N. or whatever, central bank to the world's largest economy and the reserve currency, yeah, it has direct and indirect influence over like everything and everything is interconnected and nothing is immune from the Fed. However, my answer to the question of most consequential central banker in the post-GFC era is, as you've probably guessed, Bank of Japan Governor Haruhiko Kuroda. In fact, I'd actually say that he's more consequential than central bankers who were actually in the midst of the OA crisis, um, and dare I even say Greenspan and Volcker. And why? First of all, let me just give you my personal interpretation of consequential, okay? So as I said, Fed commands the most power and influence, but it does so for any given moment in time. Consequential in this context isn't who commands the most like momentary influence, but who influences that which carries the most influence by breaking new ground and setting precedence for said powerful forces to then follow. And so therefore in that respect, it's hands down the Bank of Japan um, and Governor Kuroda. Now, the two broad reasons why he's my pick as I've expressed countless times before, BOJ is the world's monetary policy experimentation laboratory, right? I've expressed this notion, you know, that the BOJ leads other major central banks in policy framework by roughly a decade due to the kind of decade-long head start in aging demographics and debt levels. Um, but this has also been, been confirmed by like people much smarter than I am, such as that of, again, Mike Howell from Cross Border Capital, most recently Jillian Tett from FT, and many, many others. BOJ is like the monetary you know, laboratory. When I say that, you know, it's not just that they lead, but the, they're actually experimenting into uncharted territory as they go, like, like dropping rates to zero, the zero bound and leaving them there, inventing QE, inventing QQE. Um, not the first to implement negative rates, but one of the few that did, and currently the only central bank that's still in negative rate land and obviously yields growth control. And when I say monetary laboratory, 
laboratory to the world, I don't mean like as a spectator sport by the other majors. I mean things like summer of 2016 when ex-Fed chair Ben Bernanke flies to Tokyo and helps design yield curve control and then that's unveiled as actual policy in September of that year. So basically central banks worldwide, they're fixated on the BOJ um, and more so the outcomes of its policy and sort of unintended consequences and all that. And just because they don't adopt like a certain policy yet doesn't mean that like it went under the radar or something. It just simply means that they also watch BOJ for what not to do um, with their like options. So again, Fed is the most powerful. Um, but if the Fed is being directly led by and influenced by the Bank of Japan, who's setting precedents for others to follow and their others are guiding based on the BOJ, then the BOJ is the most influential and consequential. And then so within this most consequential central bank, the Bank of Japan, who is the most consequential governor to take the helm? And that's hands down, obviously, Governor Hariko Kuroda and his like decade of policy precedent setting. And then there's the matter of Governor Kuroda, who has blown the biggest asset bubble of all time. Okay, so a 500 trillion yen, half a quadrillion yen, market cornering of the second largest sovereign debt market in the world, Japanese government bonds, JGBs. Put the notional size aside for a moment and just think about the asset class itself, okay? So take like 2008, the US housing um, and the derivatives bubble that burst and nearly ended the world. Thankfully, central bankers, the put option writer of last resort, were there to backstop things. Um, and barely so, and leaving a carnage everywhere in, in doing so. But that said, governments and central banks were the only actors with the capacity to come in at the time and rescue and via buying assets, namely government bonds, in exchange for massive like liquidity injections. What happens when the asset class that's being inflated are government bonds? And the actor behind the bubble is a major government and central bank who bails out the rescuer of last resort. What are the implications of the most third most traded currency in the world? Like nothing happens in a vacuum, right? Um, like look what happens right now was a run on a niche US regional bank with a uh, duration mismatch and look at like the global cross asset impact look what happens when the long end of the UK guilt curve blows up Bank of England has to immediately start conducting emergency yield curve control what if that very prescription is itself the problem because it's been run for too long frankly that's the world that the government court is leaving behind okay now here's a scary thought the world needs the Bank of Japan to maintain this bubble, this massive bubble, and obviously manage it, okay? There's no such thing as a soft pop. Kuroda, putting aside that he's the one who, you know, created this bubble, obviously not himself alone, um, but Kuroda has managed to keep this bubble afloat. And you can only prevent an existing bubble from blowing up by just continuing to expand it ever further. Does the incoming governor of the Bank of Japan, Ueda, does he have the wherewithal to take the baton from Kuroda and, and maintain this? Th does anybody, can Kuroda himself theoretically do it? I don't have those answers, but those are real questions worth exploring. And hence, Kuroda is the most consequential. Now, just to be absolutely clear, I'm not fear monger here, and nor am I even doing like a Kuroda is the devil blame game or anything like that, okay? I'll express my opinions on the matter later if you want. Not that you should really care what I have to say. I'm just going to lay out the facts objectively, just to inform. And so I ask that you watching this or listening to this, just do it the same, right? Without any like um, previous, like preconceived notions for or against Kuroda or the BOJ, because ultimately, look, do we care about what some guy did shuffling pieces of digital paper around Tokyo for the last decade? Or do we care about our net worth standing and our, you know, our, our, li our li livelihoods and well-being? Now, what separates Kuroda from his post-war predecessors um, and his fellow G5 central bank heads. So Kuroda was specifically chosen because he was seen as the only one who would actually carry out the radically unthinkable and to stick with it until desired outcomes are realized, come hell or high water. Um, and after an unprecedented decade long dual tenure um, upon reappointment, for better or for worse, I think that we could objectively conclude that Kuroda indeed has faithfully carried out his job against enormous headwinds and pressures that every other central banker would and had buckled under. So take like Kuroda's 
predecessor, Governor Shirakawa, right, uh, who Crow, Crow didn't like openly criticize him personally, um, but he did vocalize his opposition towards the BOJ, um, and that his notion that deflation was so entrenched that it needed like shock therapy. Um, and Shirakawa was the one who invented QE in the first place, and still Crow is like that, right? And compare Kuro to like you know other major central bank heads, right? With regards to like policy pivoting at the Fed, the ECB, the PBOC, the Bank of England, the RBA, whatever, right? Everyone's like pivoted or caper tantrumed or didn't stand up to like incoming live fire the way that Kuro has. Bernanke, Yellen, Powell, Lagarde, whoever. Um, probably the worst in Kuro's book is uh, RBA's uh, Governor Low, um, who attempted yield, yield curve control for like a year and a half and then threw in the towel. And it wasn't even real yield curve control, probably in his book, because it was done at the front end of the Aussie yield curve, rather than, you know, which is close to like the cash rate itself. But Kuroda's worldview was that, you know, the longer that Japan muddles like in and out of like half measures and fluctuates between like easing and tightening and walking on like eggshells because the post um, bubble BOJ didn't want to repeat a, a runaway asset bubble again, right? The longer that Japan isn't smacked out of like deflationary comatose, the more permanent it will become. And at some point, no amount of like pressing the nuclear option will work. Like if you like detonate a monetary nuke on a barren planet, is anyone gonna feel it or hear it, right? Kuroda executed in like diving headfirst into uncharted waters and once doing so, he never relented. So much so that in the course of this past decade under Kuroda, the BOJ now finds itself in a position where there is no turning back, regardless of who's at the helm. The Bank of Japan's policy is no longer run by the personnel. Rather, the personnel are being run by the policy. You can't unwind 500 trillion yen long JGB portfolio into something that you've destroyed that no longer exists as a market. Um, you can't let borrowing costs increase to fair value of the world's most indebted uh, nation as measured by debt to GDP. With a demographic picture that points to increased debt burden and increasing deficits, and uh, of course, yes, that part falls on the government um, and this endless spending and debt issuance, and they're of course to blame first and foremost, but who is enabling this? The unconditional creditor and buyer of government debt, the central bank. So BOJ isn't exactly completely, uh, you know, uh, innocent party here either. Um, and although Kuroda's tenure may be over, it really doesn't matter for all intents and purposes because Kurodonomics doesn't just walk out the door in a cardboard box with his like highlighters and hole punchers. Kurodonomics is here to stay, and the incoming governor Ueda will inherit the current status that the BOJ is in. It's not an etch a sketch pad that you just shake. Okay, um, again, BOJ policy runs the personnel, not the other way around. That's why Crota is the most consequential central banker. That's why it's worth taking a look at his historic tenure and how he's completely and permanently transformed the landscape and the world at large. Right? Now, this isn't like some retirement party. And also, this is not the end of an era. Okay, It might be the symbolic end of, uh, end of an era, but you know, an era that carries on. This is the reason why I'm doing this look back at Kuroda's, like tenure. Right? It's not for like a history lesson. Um, I'm doing this because we have to look back at what he's done. That's the only way to be able to look forward to find out what's, to try, try to think about what's next. Okay, so first things first, who the hell was Kuroda pre-BOJ? So clearly he's a very sharp guy with a multifaceted career in economic policy um, and very much an international experience. He's an international guy, right? Haruhiko Kuroda will forever be remembered and known for his role as governor of the Bank of Japan, but Kuroda actually spent the first 40 years of, years of his career at the Ministry of Finance, four times longer than, you know, on the fiscal side than the monetary side, okay? Like, he joined immediately after graduating from the University of Tokyo. He then got an Oxford degree um, in economics and then rejoined um, the Ministry of Finance. He rose the ranks through the decades, um, basically using kind of his international mind frame and his English fluency, um, to his advantage, that's something that's very rare, a rare asset in Japan, even today. Um, and then within the Ministry of Finance, he eventually took the Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs position. That's the chief like currency position of the country, which means that that's the, that's the person who would be directly involved with like FX interventions. And so keep that in mind. I'm sure that many of you know exactly where that's going to be going. Then after that, Kuroda becomes the president of the Asia Development Bank, um, and that's where he. 
uh, had, truly has you know, an international role far more than being like a G5 central bank head, um, no matter what the country is. Um, and he was, you know, in, in ten, intensely working with like Asia developing nations, those who, with dollar denominated debt and are like at the whim of the uh, Fed policy and, you know, the dollar. Um, and so he's very familiar with this notion of like peg currencies, even though he, the yen is not one. And so he has that experience and that kind of knowledge background as well, right? So very well rounded with sort of how um, sovereign debt, currency, all that works. And it was his like international attributes that really kind of shaped his worldview um, of, of Japan. And basically, that Japan's economic woes were by and large like self-inflicted. They're unforced errors. You know, a culture of like blindly clinging to the way things are and have always been done, and therefore will always be right. And he also realized that Japan is like a completely different beast in itself, like a very idiosyncratic thing, and therefore you can't just copy and paste like blindly copy and paste like Western policy frameworks to Japan. Okay, now, fast forward to November 2012. Then ex-Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was rerunning um, for his big comeback to become Prime Minister again, right? So Abe was Prime Minister like prior to, but for a very short-lived tenure, um, which was followed by like political chaos in Japan, where like Japan was turning over Prime Ministers as if it was like UK in current times. So that was also the period where Kuroda's predecessor, Shirakawa, was heading the Bank of Japan. Um, just a quick comment on Shirakawa, because he takes a lot of shit, um, by which I mean from people like pre BOJ Kuroda. And to be fair to Shirakawa, like his term spanned from April 2008, like started in 2008, um, to March 2013, right? So like Lehman as a welcome gift, then the Japan earthquake, then he served five different Japan prime ministers. So like in, in his book, he writes about like, I was getting ridiculous. Like every time he would go to like a G5, G20 gathering, or whatever, he'd have to keep like introducing a new guy to his like same counterpart peers. It's like, this is our now latest finance minister or whatever. Back to uh, Abe. Okay, so during his time, like, uh, out of office, he basically, like, studied up on economics a lot. And in doing so, he came up with this one policy initiative called Abenomics, which I discussed with Jack Farley um, recently in Blockworks. Abenomics consists of three arrows. Arrow one, aggressive monetary easing. Arrow two, fiscal stimulus. Arrow three, structural reform. That arrow one, monetary stimulus, that's the key to everything, okay? So regarding like central bank independence or like debt monetization, is you know, is there central bank independence? There's central bank codependence in Japan. Is Japan monetizing its debt? Absolutely it is. And it's not a secret, it's an Abe campaign platform. It's very openly there. And in fact, in his book, in his mem not his memoirs, but he just he they publish a book. Uh, after he got killed, but he was in the middle of basically writing a book about his kind of experience and all that. Um, and he refers to the bank as a subsidiary of the government, right? He talks about sending out COVID checks, right? That is, the, our grandchildren don't have to pay for that because the Bank of Japan buys the government bonds. So there's no problem. The BOJ is a subsidiary of the government. Quite a quote. Either way, uh, that's what he runs on, and he has a massive landslide win. Um, and because he comes in cl with a clear message like, it's the economy, stupid, here's how to fix it, right? But in order to make it a reality, he needed an operator at the BOJ to execute on Arrow 1, who was as full-throated as Abe was during his, like, campaigning of Buy My Abenomics. My economic policy, Abenomics, three arrows. The first is a bold monetary policy. Second is about fiscal policy. And the third arrow, will continue sparking private investment. Japan economy is just about to break free from chronic deflation. Pandits used to say that Japan was at dusk, the land of the setting sun. They said that for a country as mature as Japan, growth would be impossible. Can you hear any such voices now? The greatest challenge in overcoming deflation in this time is to raise people's inflation expectations. The BOJ introduced the quantitative and qualitative monetary easing. People are now more vibrant and upbeat. You've been seeing deflation yeah. for a decade and a half. Yeah. You think you will get out? Yeah. 
uh, we definitely think that uh, we can eliminate deflation. It is not twilight. And we started a new monetary policy framework. But a new dawn over Japan. <laughs> if you like, or would you like anyway, to serve another five-year term? Uh, Are you willing uh, to serve another? Uh, if, if the uh, prime, uh, I can ask the Prime Minister <laughs> if you like. Ladies and gentlemen, we decide to go on major reforms. I have broken through the notion that certain reforms could never be carried out. So Kuroda wasn't like officially nominated until like February 2013, um, I think mid-February 2013. He didn't take office until March 2013, but from November of 2012, basically like a half a year prior to the, you know, him actually being in the BOJ, because of Abe's very loud campaigning, the markets moved massively. Like dollar yen from a 70 handle up to like in the 90s, almost at parity. But that's a huge price move for like nothing yet actually being delivered, right? Um, and so before first Kuroda BOJ meeting as governor, there were a lot of skeptics because of the move that had already taken place. What is going on with dollar yen? I think that there's a lot of expectations around the BOJ meeting this week. But uh, for the FX market, I think the story is to a large extent already over. We know that we're going to get a more great, uh, aggressive stance from the, from the central bank. Uh, and it's just a question of whether it's a little faster or a little slower know, than what is priced in. why is the story over when they have yet to press the nuclear button? Well, you could ask why is it up here when there's nothing to have, uh, nothing, they still have uh, yet to do anything apart from. So are you saying that they bring forward open-ended purchases, perhaps uh, get into longer data JGB notes, as long as they don't do the real controversial stuff like buying risky assets, going into foreign bonds, dollar yen is going to in fact st stay at around these levels? I believe so. I think, uh, I think from here the bigger story is, is whether this is actually going to work whether it is actually possible that Kuroda will succeed in, in dragging uh, Japan out of its 20-year deflationary slump. Now, that guy might look stupid in hindsight, but just to be fair, if you put yourself in his shoes, it's not a ridiculous view that he had. This is a lot of pricing in that has had taken place. Um, and you also had, you know, BOJ adopt a 2% inflation target in January of 2013 before that, right? But that first BOJ meeting, Kuroda blasted a massive easing bazooka to show the world this time indeed was different, that the Bank of Japan is not messing around. It used to be we would come out of these BOJ meetings, talk to the market, people would say, well, they did something, but it's not really going to make a difference. Are people saying that after this meeting as well? Certainly not. Um, as you've said, the yen has already moved on um, the announcement, and um, some of the most dramatic movement has actually been from the market that's often the quietest, which is the Japanese government bond or JGB market. Uh, ten year, which is the benchmark JGB's, um, the yields have hit record lows on this. So let's just do this. Let's look at a timeline of the BOJ's policies, major policies that it's announced. Um, and the various and changing methods that it's implemented that resulted in this blowing of this massive JGB bubble that we uh, are currently sitting on here today. So as mentioned, Kuroda kicks off his with his first, very first meeting and then the consumption tax disaster of a decision by Abe the following year in 2014 that hit the reset button uh, on Kuroda's uh, progress, and he had to start from scratch. The world's third largest economy contracted on an annualized basis. Now, Jake, none of the 18 economists surveyed by the Wall Street Journal actually said there was going to be a contraction. In fact, they thought there was going to be growth of two and a quarter percent. So what are people saying right now? Um, people are stunned at the number, uh, and you can see that in, in the way the markets reacted first thing afterwards with pretty sharp sell-offs. Um, uh, I think, you know, basically this is stating the obvious, but it suggests the underlying economy is significantly weaker than people thought uh, and was hit much harder by the first sales tax hike in April uh, than people had estimated. Right. So that's the main reason that sales tax hike earlier this, week, this year. Uh, but in terms of what the central bank can do moving ahead, uh, what are the tools right. available? Well, I mean, I would look at the central bank and also the government more broadly, but the central bank can try and do more of what they had been doing, which is adding a bunch of stimulus to the economy. Um, the problem with that is they did a big increase in, in late October. I mean, obviously, the impact of that was not uh, felt in the July-September numbers, so maybe uh, that will give a cushion going forward. Um, but that decision was also uh, made by a split five to four vote on the Bank of Japan's policy board. It's unclear if they need to do more, whether they can do more. Now, the question for the government is, 
an, an obvious first step, which is now you know all but certain, is that Prime Minister Abe will delay the scheduled next tax increase. And the question becomes whether they choose to add on even more fiscal stimulus. Uh, how big and when? How quickly can they get that through? Right now, we're still 11 months away from that expected tax hike from 8 percent uh, currently to 10 percent. Then, how likely do you think that is going to happen? The postponement. Oh, I think it's now 100 percent certain. Thing about QE is that it has like diminishing effects, right? You have to do more of it to get the same results, and then the more the markets expect it, the lower the sort of efficacy of it. So now that um, Abe put Japan in recession in 2014, shot himself in the foot, Kuroda shock launches another massive round of QQE um, as a Halloween surprise in October of 2014. Markets are completely caught off guard. Dollar yen breaks out of its like three yen, you know, trading range around that 100 level that's been for that entire year surges to the 120 handle. Nikkei rallies like another I don't know, 30% from there. JGB yields drop and seeming to, you know, be back on track, maybe. Okay, then in January 2016, BOJ shocks again by cutting rates negative, despite Kuroda explicitly insisting that negative rates will not be implemented in Japan. And he says this like as recently as like a week before implementing negative rates um, in Japan. Um, he says this to Parliament. He says this overseas at Davos. Um, but that was a kind of a critical lesson learned by Kuroda at the time because there were no more shocking markets, right? just in case the policy won't be received well um, because once it's out there an official policy language you can't take that back right so from january 2016 to brexit day in june of 2016 dollar yen falls from above 120 and then it actually cracks it below parity and actually prints 99 on brexit day stocks go on a one-way decline from January to you know mid-year, led by bank stocks and financials, 10-year JGB yields go deeply negative. Then, mid-2016, BOJ announces that there will be a policy review for the upcoming meeting, and then in September 2016, yield curve control is rolled out. When yield curve control is rolled out, that was not to cap yields to the upside as it's currently battling daily to do. It was, the yield curve control was, was implemented to steepen the JGB curve and to prevent yields from going further negative to, you know, from, from dropping further. That was the original intention of the policy. So what they're currently doing is not what yield curve control was originally like designed for or set out to do. Uh, the yield curve. So that's, that's the other big story today. And I think that addresses some of the concerns that banks, pension funds and insurance funds, uh, insurance companies had about profitability. It also could I think, I think Mr. Kuroda hopes that by having a steeper yield curve, it sort of implies that there's more inflation down the line. Whether anyone believes that or not is another question yeah. because some said artificial steepening, you know. Well, Brian, I think you've, you've nailed it there with the idea you got to see it to believe it. Let's go to the chart here right now to show the conundrum Brian Fowler uh, speaks of. Here is the Japanese yield curve. The red circle is a 10-year uh, yield. My, my distinction here, Brian, is they begin with a negative 10-year yield. The first order condition is to lift that above zero. Is there any evidence they can actually do that? Do they have the inertial force or critical mass to move price lower yield up well they can certainly cut back on purchases of longer term bonds and they've we we <clears throat> found we had a story today showing that they've actually been doing that for the last few months uh, cutting back on tenures over 25 years and and as well as the year the 10 to 25 year portion so they can continue to do that and hope that it it puts takes a little bit of the shine off those those bonds and pushes yields higher um, and then after that, BOJ kept yield curve control in place. Yes, they've moved the upper and lower uh, bands wider well, like over time, but yield curve control policy itself has remained in place and therefore unchanged, policy unchanged since, since September of 2016. I bring this up because many people seem to think that 2022 was the year of BOJ being like the weird loan outlier central bank, you know, not aligned with the global rate hiking in QT or stopping of QE. Um, that was going on. But uh, reality is the BOJ has always been an outlier marching to the beat of its own drum. It's not just in 2022. It's just a, since 
2016 uh, yields curve control inception you know since then fed hikes rates then they cut rates then they floored rates at, at zero the zero bound and then they hike rates again and now it looks like that hiking cycle might be over and that whole time boj just remains policy unchanged with yield curve control so whenever i hear about like how boj must get in line with the rest of the world well, why 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 should it it never did previously um, you know, what the rest of the world did. And even if it did, why should it, any central bank do what others are doing for the sake of it, right? Like globally coordinated policy nonsense that you hear out of like IMF and the World Bank? Like, no, okay? BOJ has, will, and always only will do what BOJ feels is appropriate and couldn't care less what others are doing, even if it means currency depreciation like we saw in 2022, clearly on display. So if that's your thesis of BOJ scrapping yield curve control, like that it needs to get in line with the rest of the world, like that's the wrong way to go about thinking about it. So between QQE one and two, negative rates, yield curve control, and now these most recently launched fund supply ops in which the Bank of Japan lands, lends funds to banks at very low rates with the hopes that they will take those funds to buy JGBs so that the BOJ doesn't have to themselves. They could also implement a negative rate on that and essentially they could pay banks to buy JGBs. They have yet to do that, but Kuroda did hint that that is a possibility at the second to last policy meeting. So between all that, BOJ has amassed an absolutely insane amount of JGBs, creating a giant sovereign bond bubble where the most indebted nation in the world can borrow at a fraction of what the risk-free U.S. Treasury rate is, okay? That's what's called a bubble. It makes no economic sense, like no economic gravity applies here. So, okay, so after all this heavy-handed buying of JGBs, what is the state of the JGB market, like a health check, if you will, of the market today? Uh, as Kuroda leaves office. So, first of all, in terms of like the notional size, again, the JGB market, the Japanese government bond market is the second largest in the world after the United States. It's over one quadrillion yen or 1,000 trillion yen. Let's call it about 8 trillion USD um, of government debt in the form of JGBs outstanding. More than half of the JGB market is now owned by the Bank of Japan. They've had that threshold for some time now. Now, if you look at this chart on uh, the BOJ flow of funds data, this is compiled by Bloomberg, you'll see that before Kuroda's tenure, okay, so before he, right before he started, BOJ owned 10% of JGB's outstanding. And JGB's outstanding, that amount was smaller, okay? So BOJ owned 10% of a smaller pie. The biggest owners of JGB's, um, were Japanese pension funds at 12%, insurance companies at 23%, and the biggest by far were banks who owned 40% of the JGB market in late 2012. Again, uh, at that time, BOJ only owned 10% before Kuroda started in March 2013. Three years later, uh, in September 2016, like right as they launched Yield Curve Control, um, BOJ is now at the top spot in percentage of ownership at 36%. As for the other categories of holders, pension funds, um, they decreased their holdings from 12% to 8% of outstanding, but this is also largely a sort of government-directed prerogative, okay? Because the Japanese government pension fund, also known as the GPIF, which is the world's largest pension, government pension fund, like 1.4 trillion USD in assets, um, the GPIF decided to make, you know, changes in their asset uh, holding composition and rebalanced to own less domestic JDBs that yield nothing. So their slight decrease in ownership percentage was like an intended result that wasn't necessarily BOJ like kind of squeezing them out. Uh, insurance companies, their percentage of holdings barely changed. Okay, uh, they're just they were they were they were holding you know just under a quarter of outstanding JDBs, um, and they remain that. Um, and that's largely because insurance companies are regulated and mandated to hold a certain amount of JGBs on the balance sheet, um, which is still the case today for anyone who's wondering who would ever buy JGBs. Not all like JGBs or any government bond um, buying by the private sector 
investor, not all of that is done out of like pure economic decision making. Sometimes it's just regulatory. Sometimes it's like duration, mismatching, and so on and so forth. Um, so BOJ goes from owning 10% to 36% as the largest holder of JGBs within three years of taking office under Crota. Um, but pensions and insurance companies' proportions of ownerships didn't really change much. Okay, so who got squeezed out? Banks did. Banks went from being the largest owners of JGBs outstanding at 40% um, the, to then just being only 20% or so in 2016. Okay, That's the class of market participants that got shoved out of the game um, during the Corona era. And now banks own 10% and BOJ owns over 50%, Okay, so th- which is a complete flip from pre corona where banks owned almost half and BOJ owned you know, 10%. Now that's, those figures are turned around, flipped around. In other words, under Kuroda's JGB buying operations, the BOJ literally shifted like JGB ownership out of the hands of the financial sector and onto the central bank balance sheet where they will be held to maturity. Just like the pension funds and insurance companies, these are all like, you know, buy-in holders, right? Banks, on the other hand, are market makers and they're liquidity provider- providers, right? They're agents of and facilitators that are necessary for markets to operate, for trades to, to occur, for buyers and sellers to find one another. Um, JGBs trade OTC over the counter, right? They're not on a listed exchange like stocks or futures or whatever. So the prices are negotiated between private parties and then they're reported, right? So when you remove or when you diminish this critical actor from market, then market functioning is going to diminish alongside it. Like, what do you expect, right? And it's this very factor, market functioning or lack thereof, which is the reason for the December 2022 BOJ shock change to widen the trading bands on yield curve control. YCC upper and lower limits moved from 25 basis points to 50, which effectively was a rate hike as 10-year JGB yields had been basically pressed up against that 25 basis point ceiling in a rising global global yield environment um, and had gotten to the point where the shape of the JGB yield curve was completely screwed up, where the 10-year tenor was being artificially capped at 25. And so and like so much of the concentrated buying was being done at that specific 10-year maturity. But meanwhile, shorter dated 8-year and 9-year JGBs were not only yielding higher than 10s, but they were yielding even higher than the 25 base point yield curve control cap. Okay, so it makes no sense. For the tenors beyond 10, uh, 10 years, such as like a 20-year, 30-year, 40-year JGB, like the, the, the super long end, that end is basically like a vertical line of steepness. Okay, so it's an incredibly steep like 10s, 20s curve, and it's an inverted like 8s, 10s curve, if you will. Okay, so it's this distortion. This was the reason that the BOJ had widened the yield curve control bands in December of 2022. Um, And this is what they will continue to base their decisions regarding yield curve control policy on, at least for the moment. What's not driving policy decisions, especially as it relates to December 22 shock yield curve control change? Inflation. Japan inflation has absolutely nothing to do with the policy change in December. And frankly, it won't be the primary consideration on yield curve control policy, policy decisions for some time. Market functioning is what the reason was and is. This is plainly and explicitly expressed by the Bank of Japan in the December 22 monetary policy statement as the reason and repeated time and time again. And, you know, that this is not based on CPI and to the, to the press, to anyone and everyone from that very December, like, press conference is that this yield curve control change, this is absolutely not Bank of Japan tightening, tapering, pivoting, removing accommodation, whatever, okay? Rather, yield curve control bands were widened in order to improve the easing efficacy, um, not to mention the increase in their scheduled monthly bond buying that they did, okay? so. Again, these are, you don't, you don't have to trust central bankers, okay? But that doesn't mean that they're always lying. Um, and it makes perfect sense if you look at it from that angle. Why would they suddenly react to CPI at the third to last meeting? Like, that's not what changed. What changed was 
sharply deteriorating uh, market functioning conditions and this really messed up yield curve. And so if they thought if they could smoothen out the yield curve, if they just lifted the 25 basis point um, uh, cap 250, that backfired, but that was still the intent. So the conundrum is that massive JGB buying creates massive market dysfunctions and massive market dysfunctions necessitate for more JGB buying. This is like the state of the, you know, that's the state of the market that we're in. Um, and when you have such illiquidity, it, call, it, you know, calls for or it creates extreme price swings and volatility um, because there just isn't any depth in the market. Now, Kuroda hands off to another governor. But as I said, it doesn't matter if it's Kuroda himself or someone else occupying the seat. Like the, the human being occupying that seat doesn't matter. Kurodonomics in some form is here to stay. Okay. In other words, this isn't the end of an era. It's a symbolic end because the guy will be gone, but it's not the end of the era because Kuroda's policies are permanent. Um, and it's not necessarily because Kuroda made them permanent. But he almost did, you could argue that he almost did so out of necessity, okay? Now, if I'm correct that the policy now runs the show and not the policymakers, okay, over the long run, though, yeah, in the, in the short term, they could try to do something, but they're going to have to come back to it, right? Because they're going to create so much market turmoil. Um, but that essentially means that Japan is now stuck in an artificially low-yielding environment for God knows how long, probably forever. And they have to be. Right, because what's Japan going to do? Japan is spending one quarter of its budget currently on servicing interest on its debt, interest that is at rock bottom levels, a quarter of its debt, and the de debt burden is only going to grow. Population shrinking; it's getting more elderly. They are not contributing to the tax base; rather, they are a burden on the tax base. Um, and the government's cutting to spend not just on you know entitlements but increasing on defense spending and things like that right where the hell is this money coming from it's coming from their unconditional credit of the bank of japan this is how the japan's able to operate it's only able to operate with a 250 percent debt gdp ratio because the bank of japan is artificially keeping yields at rock bottom levels and Buy and buying up like entire issuances. So Japan is clearly monetizing its debt. Um, if not for the bank, Japan, there would the who the hell knows where you know ten year JGB yields would be. Uh, Japan does not get to borrow money for half a percent ten years out, while the U.S. Treasury has to pay multiples that to borrow for eight weeks up. But Japan just cannot let yields go higher, period. So did Kuroda just basically spend his decade at the BOJ pumping a 500 trillion yen, uh, you know, bond market bubble? Yeah, I guess he did by like action. But did he do it like by kind of conscious choice? Did he do it by preference? No, not in my view. He did that out of necessity. He did that because of the fiscal side of the government. Because and this would fall on him too, because he's enabling them. But again, if not for the Bank of Japan, there is no like regular functioning civilization in, in Japan. Um, all of like the government officials that are like, grilling him and whatever on on like yield curve control and blah, blah blah i'm always thinking like where in the hell do you think like your basic operating budget comes from like be, the, this guy's literally paying your salary but either way the bottom line is that if japan yields rise sharply abruptly and sharply and continue to then one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to get a sort of mechanical, technical, you know, explosion of volatility, much like th like the case in the Bank of England and the UK guild situation from uh, September to October of 2022, exacerbate volatility and illiquidity in an already volatile and illiquid 
environment in global bonds, including very much the U.S. Treasury market. Again, we saw this on display with the two-year yield and all that. I mean, that wasn't all just Silicon Valley Bank related. That was also March futures on JGB's expiry as well. And if you look at other expiries, quarterly expiries on JGB futures, you'll see massive moves happening in yields and in bank stocks globally that coincide with that. So yeah, a lot of it is related to the bank flow, you know, the bank sell-off flow and all that. A lot of it's also related to just plain correlation with like yields, bank stocks, and all that. So that's one thing that could happen that could break. The other thing is that the is that Japan is simply unable to pay its bills and Japan defaults. Um, and so I'm going to get into that in a different video because this one's getting long um, about this end game about when Japan defaults because Japan will default. It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when and on who and how okay so that's for another video because this is obviously getting very long um and the corona legacy it's permanently in place Spencer, would you like but would you like anyway, to serve another five-year term i i i, would, I, I, I are I, you willing I, to serve another I, if, if the I, prime, I, I can ask the prime minister <laughs> but uh i can say uh everything from uh the QQE with yield uh, curve control. Uh, I mean, like the Fed, uh, uh, there may be some uh, challenging issues, but uh, I'm quite sure that BOJ has enough tools to manage the situation uh, faced by uh, uh, exiting process. Whoever the leader, who, whichever, uh, whoever. That's right, whoever the leader. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm quite sure that exiting uh, from the QQE uh, with uh, illegal control uh, could be uh, managed uh, uh, quite well. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> Governor Corot has been around for a very long time. It sounds like he may be around over the time. There is no like end of an era because the era lives on. Um, it doesn't leave with him. Uh, just the giggly guy leaves. All right, everyone, that's it for me. Thanks for watching Market Depth. Uh, if you enjoyed this, make sure that you like and subscribe. Make sure that you follow on your favorite podcast apps, as well as Blockworks Macro uh, YouTube channel. Make sure that you have your notifications turned on because Market Depth will mostly be about price action from the day uh, in Asia, and they will be time sensitive, so you'll want to make sure uh, when a video does get released. On behalf of Blockworks Macro, my name is Wes Nakamura. Thanks a lot. See you next time.